Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is David Sproles, and I'm the president of the New York School of Interior Design. We are so pleased to have you here with, for what promises to be a fantastic journey, uh, specifically for tonight's program called Nest Magazine, A Wild Adventure. Nest was technically a shelter magazine, but different from the beginning and in almost every way from its peers. Its brief but impactful life started 20 years ago this year uh, in 1997, and publication stopped in 2003. With Joseph Holtzman at the helm as editor-in-chief, Nest pushed the boundaries and created an outrageous, unique, and sometimes provocative experience for readers as it explored every kind of dwelling. So I'd like to start by introducing Glenn Gisler. Glenn is the president of Glenn Gisler Design, a residential design firm he founded 30 years ago. He earned degrees in architecture and fine arts from the Rhode Island School of Design and went on to work for acclaimed designer Juan, designers Juan Montoya uh, and the architect Raphael Vignoli uh, before opening his own firm. He's been included in House Beautifuls and New York Magazine's 100 Top Designers lists. Uh, he, his work is regularly, regularly featured uh, in leading publications including Town & Country, El Decor, In Style, House & Garden, House Beautiful, Interior Design Magazine, and many, many more. Uh, Glenn can certainly tell you more about some of the work that he's doing uh, with ICFF and as the current president of ASID's Metro, New York Metro chapter. Uh, for now, though, uh, Glenn, I believe, is going to come up uh, and tell us a little bit about Lisa Zeger, who will give our presentation tonight. Uh, and he'll introduce us to Mitch Owens, who joins the panel later in the evening. So sit back and enjoy. Glenn, it's all yours. Good evening. Um, I want to thank David Spruels and the staff at uh, New York School of Interior Design. I've done a number of events here, and they're always magnificent to work with, and uh, they always host a fantastic event. Um, the, uh, I also want to thank um, Lisa Zeiger for her remarkable presentation, which you're about to see, and to thank Lisa and uh, Mitch Owens for their insights and antidotes about this wild ride at Nest. The, uh, I believe that the lasting cultural effects really continue to reverberate today. This talk, uh, I th you know, I've known Lisa for uh, uh, quite some time, and um, uh, uh, oh shoot! <laughs> oh no! I'm sorry. Sorry. So um, uh, tonight's speaker is somebody I've known for a really long time. Uh, Lisa Zeiger is a writer and decorative arts historian, and like, ton like tonight's talk, her life would, could be described as a wild adventure. Born and raised in Bel Air, California, she's a graduate of the Barnard College, in, uh, she, where she studied comparative literature and a minor in German. Uh, after that, she continued on to Columbia University Law School, uh, at this point seemed like an unlikely place for her to end up, working only for six months in Los Angeles in entertainment law. And, and, uh, and while living in Los Angeles, which is an automobile town, a girl needs a car, so Lisa drove a 1960 blue and white convertible Corvette Stingray. Um, it didn't quite work out working in law in Los Angeles, so she left LA and left her fabulous car behind, setting forth in what, becomes, uh, what has become a peripatetic lifestyle that started in London. She did a year of postgraduate work in the decorative arts at Sotheby's London, and then, because that wasn't enough, she did another year of postgraduate work in the decorative arts at the University of Glasgow as part of a Christie's program where she received a post, uh, postgraduate diploma. And during that time, the interior of her Glasgow apartment was featured in a uh, beautiful story in World of Interiors. Lisa's remarkable writing, uh, and I emphasize remarkable, has been appeared in the New York Times, the art newspaper, Apollo, uh, in her blog, uh, Book and Room, and uh, Highland Magazine, uh, and catalog essays for Rosemary Truckle, and among many other publications. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Lisa Zeiger, our speaker tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I have a list of acknowledgments that could have been really longer than the talk itself, but in any case, um, I will make a few of them here. I want to say, quoting the great novelist Henry James, who was himself no stranger to the decoration and description of rooms, it takes a great deal of history to produce a little literature. 
Into this brief talk about Nest Magazine, so close to my heart, have gone the efforts, help, and care of innumerable people, a few of whom I will mention here. First of all, Glenn Gissler, who not only invited me to speak here tonight, but who has been a constant mentor, an occasional employer, much to his torment, as well as a faithful friend to me for over 23 years. I'm also indebted to writer Mitch Owens, whom we are fortunate to have joining us for a discussion following the talk, for his photographic memory of amusing and thought-provoking anecdotes about the early days of Nest Magazine, which inspired me, in turn, to make certain additions to this text. Um, graphic designer Martine Mallory has been a lifesaver, cheerful and charming, bringing not only her technical expertise to tonight's presentation, but the most refined aesthetic judgment in discerning how to present these beautiful images. <clears throat> Many thanks to Amy Gilman Kennard and uh, Chris Spinelli, Art Director of NYSID. Um, Amy Gilman is Communications Coordinator who tirelessly provided splendid social media outreach and both of them provided patient, instantaneous, and constant administrative and technical support. My dear friend, Stefan Reed, who I don't think is here tonight, um, sort of marched me through the writing process, making sure that I ate and chain smoked. Carl Mar Kyle Marshall of Ralph Lauren and author Carl Delatorre have for the past four years been wonderful friends and supporters of my mission as a writer, seeing me sternly through all peccadillos and detours. And last but not least, I offer vast thanks to Christopher Highland, who holds an honorary doctorate from NYSID, and Constantino Castellano, loyal friends to me for 11 years and acquaintances from the time 23 years ago when I first stepped into their showroom in the D&D &D building, who opened their beautiful Chelsea home to me in the days preceding this talk as a place of repose and study. Many thanks to all of you. Nest Magazine, A Wild Adventure. Um, these are the logos. We, we always changed our logos but this is a selection of them. In 1997, the first issue of Nest, a magazine of interiors, appeared, and I was lucky enough to be on its masthead as decorative arts editor. At Nest, I was privileged to work for three years as one of a small, passionately inspired band of writers and designers whom founder and editor Joseph Holtzman shown here in our office, which was really more of a library, wearing his signature clad pants, um, permitted to incarnate in the most luxuriously printed form imaginable our wildest visions without regard for either cost or public opinion. We were a group of dedicated eccentrics, not in our first youth, most of us were in our late 30s, <clears throat> who brought our lifetimes of sweet and sour intellectual and personal experience as devotees of rooms and objects to the glorious task of creating something completely new. And um, here is a spread. You also saw the same room on the cover. This belonged to an IKEA stylist from New Jersey named Raymond Donahue, who was consumed and obsessed with the figure of Farrah Fawcett. <laughs> And he went so far even as to have the barcode from her Fabergé Ferro shampoo tattooed on his neck. <laughs> and uh, we duly inclu included a photograph of that, but it, it, I don't have it here. But this is his room, which, as you can see, he papered, and he not only wallpapered, but he did the ceiling with homemade Xerox images of Ferro's many uh, magazine covers, and it's kind of the perfect inaugural uh, image for Nest, because Joe himself was an obsessional character, and he, but he liked projects, even if they were peculiar, to be as fully realized as possible, and I think that Raymond Donahue did fully realize his Farrah preoccupation. Um, let's see. Occasionally, some of Nest's content bordered gently on, oh, sorry, I just wanted to point out these two slides. Um, we often had die-cut covers. In fact, always we did, at great expense. 
So you can see on the left the scalloped cover, and then on the right um, the fu future perfect with an abstract image. And those are very characteristic covers. Um, occasionally, some of Nest's content bordered gently on erotica. As Joe wrote, quote, our houses have private parts. Nest is no waste up publication. <laughs> Nudes throughout the lifetime of the magazine would abound, from vintage black and white photos of a nudist camp's rather shapeless denizens to the stunning female bodies accompanying our subscription ads. Every nipple and pubic delta a mild chalk for the unsuspecting reader and po potential subscriber. Um, so you can see with these poor people that we sort of pilloried on the left. <laughs> and actually, um, the funny thing is that I think we used those, that image for the masthead that month so that the contributors' faces are pasted on top of um, <laughs> the bodies. And I'm, I'm not sure where that photo, the photograph on the right actually came from, but uh, it's a good example of what we were thinking. Um, I just wanted to return to this image for a second. This is a story that I wrote about the great architect Carlo Molino and his Polaroids of nude prostitutes. And Todd Oldham, the fashion designer, this was the cover, Todd Oldham dis, um, designed seven what I call modesty panels to go around the whole issue. And you could not even, you couldn't unveil the nude or open the issue without first undoing this ogival button that you see in the middle. So that's an example of the kind of um, tactile splendor that Joe consistently sought for the magazine. Um, Nest Magazine, in existence from 1997 to 2003, was a once-in-a-lifetime experience, not only for its creators, but for its readers, who uncovered in its pages a completely new, I want to say nude, but there we have the Adam and Eve issue, which also featured scratch-off bathing suits by Todd Oldham. It said, scratch off at your own risk. <laughs> Um, who uncovered in its pages a completely new interpretation of what it means to have in and live in our own habitats. Nest held up a mirror to many kinds of dwellings, not just the professionally designed or grand, but the privacies, humble or hoity-toity, plain or ornamental, we construct for ourselves. Joe's only criterion for featuring a dwelling was the question, is it interesting? As Joe wrote in his inaugural letter to the reader, quote, Home is a single truth always known, the drumbeat of obsession, a place built against the outside. And I love that quote very much. It's, it's stayed with me for many years. Um, here are some examples of the interiors we featured. This was Mr. Marcelino, a Dominican uh, transvestite priestess who in his garb as Miss Anna Isa was um, presided over a Santeria church called the Church of the Mysterios in Santo Domingo. And this was photographed by Mitch Epstein, um, who also did a series on voyeurs, but that's another uh, story in the magazine. And it was written by Julia Alvarez. Here's, I, I put this picture in just because it, I think it evinces the kind of um, wild extrovert quality that we saw it in interiors. I believe this actually is a restaurant, which is unusual for Nest because we focused primarily on residential subjects, but it's a very vivid and beautiful image. This is the artist Francis Bacon's studio filled with mounds of torn newspaper and endless spatters of paint. And uh, we commissioned the English novelist Beryl Bainbridge to write about it. She said, this is not the product of a man spinning out of control, but the aftermath of his creative process. And when you think about the highly ordered and almost minimalist works that Bacon created, it's fascinating to see the sort of disarray, the wild disarray of his studio. Here is legendary Vogue editor Diana Vreeland's apartment, um, decorated by Billy Baldwin, whom she instructed 
that she wanted to create a garden in hell. It famously was lacquered all red. And the story for Nest was written by her son, Tim Vreeland, and included many personal photographs of this particular dwelling. So although I believe it had been, I'm sure it was published before, Nest caught a, a very intimate sort of glimpse of this particular um, apartment. Here's one of my favorite stories about the French artist designers Pierre et Gilles, who um, <clears throat> are photographed here by Jan Groover in black and white platinum prints that were printed, Joe had printed onto very expensive parchment paper as sort of an insert in the magazine. Those pages were done on, on parchment for a, a very soft um, sort of ancient <clears throat> effect. And um, their apartment, as you can see, was decorated with innumerable figurines of pop icons, supermodel images, and here two mermen. And it was described by the late Naomi Shore, who was a professor of French at Yale and was earlier than that was my professor of French at Columbia um, as a retablo that is domestic, artistic, and ecstatic. And I will return to those three little words. <laughs> what was Nest? I cannot describe or explain Nest without an account of its cast of characters. Nest was the absolutely unique, beautiful, and sometimes bizarre creation of editor and founder Joseph Holtzman, an interior decorator, painter, and art collector from Baltimore, who until founding the magazine had lived almost as a recluse. And here's a portrait of him as a teenager in Baltimore. He, he, he said uh, in his room in his parents' house in Baltimore as a virgin decorator. Um, and, uh, anyway, he emerged from that state finally with understated aplomb into the public eye with the launch of the magazine. I'm reminded by Mitch Owens that Joe was a sort of desescent, the exquisite eremitic hero of Huisman's 1884 novel of decadence against the grain, inventing miraculous rooms in extreme seclusion. And I visited a house he decorated in Baltimore and you know, one speaks of Proust's cork-lined room. Well, Joe actually had lined an entire dining room in cork, which I believe is actually a toxic material. But anyway, so the clients were sort of left with that. Um, prior to Nest, Joe was a borderline agoraphobic, once arranging to attend an important auction in London by booking a back-to-back round-trip ticket so that he would not have to spend a single night in a bed not his own. Nest gave Joe permission to bring his gifts into the spotlight, combining the prodigious knowledge of a self-taught savant with the instinct and skill of an artist. Now, he not only edited Nest, and we would sometimes sit for hours just concocting ideas, um, but he became the magazine's art director. He really wasn't satisfied to delegate that Im most important task to anybody else. So uh, he was not a, a, a digital native. And in fact, at that time, in the late 90s, you know, nobody except very young people were. Um, and so he, he hired a jazz musician called Tom Beckham, who was a digital native, to, um, and he referred to him as my prosthesis. <laughs> I mean, he said that publicly, so I can quote it. <laughs> and on the left is a very typical uh, Holtzman cover with, with a kind of riotous plaid. And on the right was our uncut issue with a popsicle stick, a real popsicle stick stuck to the front, with, emblazoned with the Nest logo. Um, and then here's the make make your own cover issue with a free toy inside. <laughs> and really he was, as an art director, he, his imagination was just a kind of mother load of ideas. And I could show you many more, and you will see in the endless loop that we're presenting at the end, many more covers. But um, he 
created innovations in, in layout and typography that had never before been seen in the world of magazines. Um, let's see, I'll show you two more. This, this is a page layout he did. This is Peter Gomes, who was the chaplain of Harvard University and a very avid gardener and collector of Regency furniture. So we did a story on Gomes that actually he, the Reverend wrote himself. But you see how Joe worked um, a Victorian wallpaper into the background. I believe the design is by Christopher Dresser, but I'm not completely sure. And here's a story by Mitch Owens about the Guerlain room designed by um, Berard. And um, again, Joe took, there we were showing a trompe l'oeil image, and Joe placed, he sort of embedded it against pale pink stripes. And if you look at the, those little uh, round sort of apertures, those were actually holes in the magazine. He just punched holes right, right through the issue. Joe's partner, now husband, Carl Scoggard, who began his career as a gifted classical pianist, was, by the time Nest began, a writer and translator of extraordinary texts, including, in 2016, the sonnets of Walter Benjamin, a task of mind-boggling difficulty, not to mention strangeness. Benjamin's writing is almost opaque to me, even in English. I mean, it's a level of German that is just so recondite and so out of this world, I don't know. He must have spent a decade doing it. But anyway, Carl contributed much to the magazine as a writer in, in, in shaping the magazine's sort of narrative voice. I think that between you and me, I think he helped Joe with a lot of the letters from the editor, you know, because to me, I, I hear traces of his cadence in it. And he really is a genius and one whose genius is outweighed only by his modesty. I used to tell him that he hid his light under a bushel. Uh, let's see. I'll show you. Joining this duo as literary editor was the novelist Matthew Stadler, invited by Joe precisely because Matthew's sensibility came not from the world of design and aesthetics, but the universe of prose and some of its more outrageous practitioners, including Charles D'Ambrosio, Eileen Miles, the poet and author of a recent memoir, Chelsea Girls, the novelist Dennis Cooper, Frederick Tooten, Julia Alvarez, Tom Vanderbilt, and Larry Rinder, among others. Matthew himself, a Guggenheim fellow, is the author of Alan Stein, a fictional portrait of Gertrude Stein's brother. To Nest, Matthew brought not only his literary talent, but a convoy of post-beat generation writers. Joe's vision, merged with Matthew's, was to have writers who would cast a rebel eye upon the terrain of interiors, <coughs> applying words and ideas never before used to interpret them. So that's Matthew. In I believe in Portland, Oregon, where th this was, again, these, these were early days in the digital revolution, but we had um, a remote literary editor. He wasn't remote in all ways, but he, he, he lived in Portland and he commissioned people from there. So this is one of the stories he did called On the Beach, and it, it documents a sort of jaunt that he and that Matthew and fashion designer Todd Oldham took to a very fancy hotel in Miami. But the reason I picked this is because of the title. He was definitely referring to the 1960s movie On the Beach, which is about a post-nuclear holocaust. And um, bombs figured prominently in Matthew's stories. I don't know why exactly, but Here's another one. This is an underground bomb shelter mm -hmm. photographed by the great photographer Robert Polidori. Um, and as you can see, all the astroturf and everything, it's a sort of, well, this is the literal garden in hell, the garden in the un underworld. Um, let's see, finally, this is a very peculiar story that Matthew commissioned, which was about um, a stonemason in um, and sculptor, a sort of outsider artist, 
at the turn of the 20th century in Florida, who sculpted a house for his nymphette love um, entirely of coral. And it's photographed here in black and white um, by Diane Cook. Uh, in engaging, oh wait, let me go back for a moment, sorry. <laughs> but we'll get to that. In engaging a seeming outlier like Matthew Stadler, Joe Holtzman created the very foundation for the much deeper discourse about interior design we enjoy today in the myriad books on interiors which now attempt to interpret rooms as well as to display them. Joe and Matthew gave their writers unheard of breadth, often as much as 2,500 words with which to tell a story. We, we were to explore superficiality, surfaces, in all their amazing depth. Without Nest, I venture to say that serious narratives by interior designers, notably those collected in Carl Della Torre's Interior Design Masterclass, would not have been conceived. Without planning to do so, Joe Holtzman helped return to design writing a, a humor sometimes worthy of Oscar Wilde and certainly the seriousness we associate with Edith Wharton's and Ogden Cogden Jr.'s treatise, The Decoration of Houses, not to mention the darker side of rooms and their inhabitants, depicted in Wharton's great novel, The House of Mirth. In a sense, I was Matthew Stadler's opposite number, a student of literature who turned to scholarly study of the decorative arts in the late 1980s at Sotheby's London and the University of Glasgow Christie's. In those days, auction houses such as Sotheby's and Christie's were the only places to learn deeply about the applied arts. And of course, this has changed. You know, we now have the Bard Graduate Center for the Decorative Arts. But I learned so much from what was then called object-based teaching. My, my professors were mostly people who had either worked at the Victoria and Albert Museum or had worked a long time for Christie's or Sotheby's and therefore really handled objects and had a kind of sixth sense about them. At Nest and with Joe Holtzman, I was able for almost the first time to unite my twin obsessions, the applied arts and prose, especially the essay form. I watched my own words coming to be punctuated with scintillating photographs. And here you can see I'm in the left um, in a transparent dress in my old apartment, which was on 84th Street between West End and Riverside. This was um, a tiny apartment. It was 350 square feet. And I crammed all possible stuff into it. Um, I can tell you that the fireplace was something I brought from a school in Scotland. And above the fireplace, I, had, I borrowed an inscription from a funeral beer by Pugin I had seen at the V&A that is from 1 Corinthians 15, um, quote, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Only I had, it, I had the calligrapher do it in Greek. Um, for, <laughs> um, for Nest, with typical drama I, about this apartment, I wrote, paraphrasing Henry James, um, like Isabel Archer in The Portrait of a Lady, with incredulous terror I've taken the measure of my dwelling, paced out the diameter of the blasted circle in which I walk. I know the dimensions of my den down to its last pica. Only a magazine as extreme as Nest would have scrupled to give an eight-page spread to such a tiny abode. <laughs> and I, I want to point out something very tiny there. Um, let me see if I can do the laser thing. That book is a German book called Die Neue Wohnung, The New Apartment, or The New Dwelling. And it was written by the designer Bruno Taut in, the 19, in 1925. And he, he dedicated the book to all women for some reason. But anyway, I think it's just a curiosity. To our quartet, Joe, Carl, Matthew, and myself, the writer Mitch Owens, now decorative arts editor of Architectural Digest, came as frequent contributor, a pungent historian, and avatar of the sheer allure and high style of 20th century design and decoration. And I might add, of decoration of all eras. But, um, and he described the houses he saw in prose as opulent and refined as his subject. 
Mitch has tellingly remarked to me that Nest was about encouraging the misunderstood private aesthete to come out into the open, to leap from the secrecy of his or her dwelling into exposure and revelation, much as Joe himself had done. Quote, interiors are like clothes, says Mitch, reminding me of the great decorative arts historian Mario Praz, who described his own apartment in Rome as an, as a, quote, intimate integument, a second skin. When it came to photography, Joe spared nothing. Uh, starting with his friend, the great English photographer inter of interiors, Derry Moore, who gave Nest the run of his archive to publish and to shape articles around. And it left is a picture from a story that Mitch wrote, actually, called Remembrance of Beauty, which is about the home in the London building, Albany, owned by um, Pauline de Rothschild. And on the right is Darius Moore's photograph of Lady Diana Cooper in her house on Gower Street, London. <clears throat> uh, other celebrated photographers who work, would work for Nest included Robert Polidori, you can see his work here of Syrian mud dwellings, Nan Golden, David Armstrong, Antoine Boots, Jean-Louis Garnel, Mitch Epstein, Jan Groover, and Adam Bartos, among many others. Um, this is a probably more well-known photograph that Robert Polidori took of an, uh, an old, <clears throat> somewhat crumbling house in Havana. And he managed to get to Havana and create a book about it before its current popularity. Joe also often cross-pollinated the talents he hired, commissioning, for example, fashion designer Todd Oldham, as well as Derry Moore, to photograph brutalist architect Paul Rudolph's icily fantastic townhouse full of perilous plexiglass stairs and screens on Beekman Place. Todd's take on the stark architecture included snapshots of cute guys glimpsed in the bathroom. That's the upper right. <clears throat> and you can see all the sort of, I mean, we, we actually had a party for the magazine in this house, and it was a terrifying place because everything felt like it was just made out of plastic scaffolding. Um, <clears throat> I was wearing a see-through dress, and I, I made several people ta uh, tumble down the stairs, but <laughs> 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 that was another body in other days. Um, <laughs> As a writer and devotee of beautiful rooms, I was spoiled for choice at Nest, writing about everything from Carlo Molino's seductive 1946 apartment in Turin. And I love this. I loved this article. Um, he used, the, well, I'll first tell you about the furniture, and then we'll get to the human furniture. But um, you can see at right his a sort of glimpse of his dining room from the foyer. In the foyer are huge crenellated shells, I think at lower left, and um, bits of architectural um, sculpture. And then Saarinen's tulip chairs and Molino's own Fratini table. And at left is a prostitute that he photographed, straddling a very rare three-legged chair he had designed in the late 1930s. And uh, he used this apartment, I mean, he slept in it alone in a tiny chamber at the back, but he used to invite streetwalkers up um, to photograph them using Polaroid. And um, I wrote about this. I said, well, I'm saying now, in those days before the advances in digital photography, I wrote, Polaroid is the perfectionist wet dream, permitting mistakes to be detected and corrected in the next shot. Molino went on improving the apparently perfect shot, incising and tinting the photographs as if on paper. A narrowed waist, a scratched in snatch. Sorry. <laughs> but that's what I said. And he did it. I mean, he would incise things into the photographs, so genitalia. Um, all right, here's another only slightly less profane image. Um, it's a piece of flocked wallpaper, which Joe commissioned at great expense, um, based on a design by the artist Rosemary Trockel. 
And what she had done was she had photographed insects and all their doings, including their excrement, and had enlarged the photograph to create abstract, amorphous, sort of amoeba-like shapes. So this is caterpillar shit. And <laughs> <laughs> turned into a flocked paper. And we, you know, we had to really search for somebody who'd still do flocked papers. The, the, it's a lost art, but we found finally an Indian man in New Jersey who for $40,000 made a flocked paper. All right, so here's, this j story was one of Joe's most um, intense fantasies about incarceration and confinement. And it depicts, um, I called it a room of one's own. I wrote the introduction to it. I didn't write the, the, the women who were in this, um, I think fairly high security jail in New Mexico wrote their own texts about their rooms. But he was very curious about what it would be like to take a space that was, spaces that were absolutely uniform, sort of cookie cutter as prison cells would be and how different people would decorate them. So um, on the left, we have inmate Barbara Phillips' green cell. Everybody there sort of did uh, very matching, elaborate color themes. Dark green and gold trimmed with a gold satin dust ruffle was her bed cover. And the same thing, and a hand crocheted toilet seat cover. And then the woman on the right, Carla Session, said she painted a money sign on her pillowcase, quote, because I like money, I like green. And she had made all the ceramics that you can, I think, yeah, one can make them out in the picture. Um, finally, of the, some of the stories I did, um, this was one of my favorites. This was a woman in Washington, D.C., who lived with 150 cats in a townhouse. And I'm a cat lover, so I wasn't really that upset by the odor, but the photographer and the man who drove us there like, practically had to leave. Um, and <clears throat> it was Joe's inspiration to put glitter into the litter boxes. It was endless. Joe sought great quality <clears throat> in his curiosities, content only to show the most fully realized interiors, whether decorated by expert or amateur. In the realm of the expert, we showed the private homes and favorite project, projects of legendary decorators, many such articles written by Mitch Owens. And here is an article Mitch wrote about the Bousset House in Turin that was uh, decorated by Renzo Mangiardino, a house eight stories high, which was referred to as the slice of polenta. <clears throat> and Mitch wrote of it, it's a domestic scenario straight out of Puccini with bits of Stendhal and Maupassant grafted on for atmospheric good measure. Here's another story by Mitch, Henri Samuel at 90, the great decorator, the last home of the Pasha of Neo Pompadour chic was a veritable temple to contemporary taste by turns clashing, outré, and exquisite. There's another photograph of that wonderful house. Um, here's the Pauline de Rothschild story, which, and Mitch wrote of her, I think, very beautifully. Pauline de Rothschild wandered through the 20th century in apparent slow motion, part Edward Gorey Ingenue, part Pavlova's dying swan. Um, Mario Buada at home with his own painting of his own house. And finally, Jacques Grange. This called um, Grange a la Grange, Jacques Grange at home. This was written by Paul Franklin, who became the remote managing editor of the magazine in about, I think, 2001, maybe 2000, working from Paris. And this was photographed by Jean-Louis Garnel. Here is an historical story of which we did many. We, in this one, we recreated from a few ancient etchings via the intricate labors of German watercolorist Margita Zachert, the interiors of British sugar air and exiled sodomite 
William Beckford's 1796 Gothic fantasy, Fonthill Abbey, a monumental undertaking using Beckford's contemporary descriptions to determine colors, finishes, and textiles. Carl Scoggard wrote the text, accompanied by Philip Hewitt Jabor's architectural commentary about Beckford's ill-fated tower built on foundations with too shallow, which collapsed, luckily for Beckford, in the hands of a later owner after 30 years. I can't remember how high, Mitch, do you know how high the tower was? It was like 115 feet or something anyway. The whole thing just, whoops, imploded. Um, I would like to say a word here about Joe Holtzman's unabashed, almost defiant insistence on using the word decorator to describe what we all do and love rather than interior designer. I would venture to say that Joe found the term interior design too sanitized and strict, even puritanical, an attempt to architecturalize, if I may coin an expression, this most primal activity, one that is often instinctive and intuitive, engaged in with pleasure by most human beings, as well as by those who approach it as high art, as design. Quote, the ultimate aim of all visual arts is the complete building, declared Walter Gropius in the Bauhaus Manifesto of 1919. Gropius went on to embellish buildings was once the noblest function of the fine arts. They were the indispensable, indispensable components of great architecture. It is notable that Gropius, the most austere of architects, used the German word schmücken, meaning adorning or decorating. Um, so in other words, coming from, we think of the Bauhaus as sort of the originators of what we know as modernism and minimalism, but in fact, they saw at least their early activities as very much involving decoration and not being divorced from it. Oscar Wilde once said, it is only shallow people who do not judge by appearances. The true mystery of the world is the visible, not the invisible. Joe returned dignity to the words decoration and decorator, exalting them to their proper place among the arts, knowing well the truth of Oscar Wilde's and Gropius' observations, <clears throat> that in the surfaces of rooms and things we find great beauty and meaning, hoping they comport, though they need not always, with the underlying architecture of a building. Um, Here's Julian Schnabel, the painter, the contemporary painter, re-envisioned as a decorator, Julian Schnabel decorator. This is his house in the Hamptons. And Joe always used the word decorator. And here is a five-year-old boy called Dan, who supposedly possessed the decorator gene. <laughs> and the magazine, he lived in upstate New York, the magazine gave him a very large budget to go shopping with. And it left, you can see the room that he created, and at right we have a sort of phrenology type skull <laughs> of the poor boy and his, his uh, total pattern recall, perfect proportion, um, hypersurface sensitivity. It, I am reminded also of the German artist Joseph Boy's famous proclamation, everybody is an artist. For Joe, everybody, including animals, was a decorator, with decoration as ubiquitous and pleasurable as having sex. Nest proved again and again that artifice is organic. It is necessary to our very nature. But back to the dark side. Um, Matthew Stadler, pr Stadler probed the Montana cabin where Ted Kaczynski <coughs> con concocted the Unabomber schemes on calling the, the article Home Alone. And this shows the Unabomber's 10 by 12 Montana cabin, which was transported by flatbed truck to his trial because his lawyers were trying to prove by showing the extreme, the, the tininess of the cabin, how deranged a mind this must have been. So his dwelling was offered as evidence uh, Matthew also assigned the poet Eileen Miles to live for a week in a Dutch-designed cardboard box uh, for Rotterdam's homeless, which she set up near Nest's offices on Madison and 73rd 
writing about it in a first-person essay entitled Box of Rain. A word about that charmed space, our office, which was really more of a library. Uh, it actually was part of Joe and Carl's home, an apartment richly ornamented with everything from etchings by Delacroix, Rembrandt, and Goya to Christopher Dresser ceramics and an immense urn seen here by Dalpe Ra, the great Art Nouveau potter, which Joe has bequeathed to the Metropolitan Museum to contain in the fullness of time his and Carl's ashes. Um, I'll just flip back for a moment to show you. That curtain, I believe, was it's a velvet curtain designed by the great botanist designer, Dr. Christopher Dresser. Um, there, there's, you know, Joe combined very precious things. There's a painting by Dubuffet, one by Picasso, and one by Clay at the left, and he put them against these kind of big top circus-like stripes. You know, he was very irreverent in displaying his artifacts. Um, in decorating his home, Joe put to shame anyone who calls themselves eclectic, extravagantly mixing Pugin with Eileen Gray, Donald Judd with strange obsessive wall decorations of Joe's own design, woven, I can only use that word to describe it, into a fabric as wildly variegated as an outsider art embroidery, yet as tightly elegant as the 17th and 18th century silk damask known as bizarre, the bizarre pattern. In Joe's hands, it all went together. And here's his bedroom, his and Carl's bedroom, with a bed by the Herder brothers, you know, which one has seen things like that in the Metropolitan Museum. And here are some Christopher Dresser ceramics, a Giacometti bronze, and Henry Moore sculptures below. And so it went with the magazine. I stayed three years, my longest job ever, before setting off on a crazed jaunt to the hills of Echo Park in Los Angeles by way of Cologne, Germany, where, by the way, all the furniture you saw in my apartment is now in storage. Uh, that's a whole other story. But anyway, that was in 2000. Nest continued to evolve, ever-changing, taking perhaps a, m a more pronounced turn towards the extreme in dwelling, just as I took a turn towards extreme living, which included the Bronx, where I was an expatriate, in a sense Edith Wharton would have understood, Spanish Harlem, and Hamilton Heights in Harlem, where I live today, a grateful escapee from the Upper West Side. My own career would become as intensely checkered as one of Joe's wall designs, or perhaps as his trousers. Yet, through my travels, writing, and homes elsewhere, the adventure of Nest abides with me to this day, a memory, a drumbeat of obsession, of home, that informs every word I write, a peak experience in the invisible unity of rooms and words I had always sought, found at last through Joe Holtzman and Nest's wonderful coterie of artists, and practiced still with all the ardor I can muster. Um, this talk is subtitled, a wild adventure, and wild it was. I have always said that decorators are like wild beasts, moving, stripping, and trammeling without mercy all the impedimenta, both inanimate and human, that gets in their way. Nest cleared a shining path for the decorators, curators, collectors, editors, and writers who have come after, exhorting us all to celebrate the art of decoration as deeply, artistically, and yes, ecstatically as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Oh, thank you. This is on? Is this, is this working? Hello?
Well, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, I want to, before we get into some uh, uh, questions and really sort of chit-chat about, uh, about NAST, I want to formally introduce uh, Mitch Owens. Uh, to many people here, he may not need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, currently, Mitch Owens is the decorative arts editor, uh, and I guess you write about antiques as well at our Architectural Digest. His articles about interior decoration, architecture, style, fashion, landscape design, collecting, travel, and related subjects uh, have appeared in T, the New York Times Magazine, Departures, The World of Interiors, Travel and Leisure, Food and Wine, The New York Times, International Herald Tribune, Out, and of course, Nest. One has to pay the rent. And uh, in 2003, he was a co-curator of Cooper Hewitt uh, Museum's uh, tr uh, Triennale, Design Triennale. Uh, in 2009, he wrote uh, for Rizzoli a book, In-House, which featured the interiors of uh, the uh, Nest uh, photographer, Derry Moore. And he's also the author of two forthcoming books that will be published by Rizzoli, uh, a monograph on the outrageous interior decorator, Tom Britt. No, no reaction? <laughs> Okay, and, and a biography of the style diva, Pauline de Rothschild. Um, I do know a couple things uh, also that aren't in the bio that he gave to me, is that he's a doting father and a husband and an extraordinary host serving multi-course meals from another era. <laughs> so, right, so, so um, I guess the, if I were to, I'm on, tap it here. Am I on? You're on. Am I? So, Am I? Um, yes. So really, the, uh, I guess for me, when I was thinking about uh, what I would uh, uh, talk to the two of you about is kind of under the umbrella, is there life after Nest? You know, I mean, it seems like one of those seminal moments in life. And somehow it brings to mind the Sinead O'Connor song, Nothing Compares to You. You know, it's like the... Um, so Lisa said in her talk that, uh, that everything at Nest had informed everything since. And Mitch, I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell us or share with us how Nest has influenced your career and your thinking and maybe even your life. I, I, think, I think the wonderful thing about Nest was that um, along with the, the art direction and photography and the sort of extravagance of what we, we did, Joe really encouraged his writers to be as purple as humanly possible. Um, <laughs> he seemed to enjoy that a lot. Um, and, and, but he wanted you know, there to be a lot of uh, you know, very deep information so you could cloak it in these sort of brocades and, and silks and bright colors and things. But there had to be a lot of scholarship. So I think that was a really exciting thing for me as a writer uh, because he just sort of let you go and, and write like 2,500 word stories which was insane. I mean, nobody does that. So what would be a it's typical... Not a, it's not a, a length that anybody reads. Right. Anymore. So what would be a normal length today? 800. 800, okay. 700 or 800. But I mean, for 2,500 words is, is, is quite something. Right. But there are stories you, you need 2,500 words to, to tell the story. And luckily, Joe allowed that. So but now what it's done now, I think what Joe helped me do was um, try to make an 800 or 1,000 word story as rich as I could have made a 2,500 word story. So it's a lot of editing and re-editing and re-editing and distilling so that it sounds the same in less space. Fabulous. So, so, but, so that's how it's influenced your writing. And I imagine that's also influenced your thinking. But what about the way in which you view the world? Has it colored? Is it like the uh, Technicolor glasses or something that 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 uh, reinvigorated? I mean, <laughs> when I was asked, and I cannot remember when it happened, but when I was asked to uh, by Joe to write for the magazine, which I didn't realize I'd done the first issue. I was Many shocked. stories. Lisa first. showed me, and I said, "Oh God, I had no idea." About um, it was so long ago, I thought. Um, I would go home after these meetings at Nest, and you saw Joe's apartment, this sort of phantasmagoria. And I would go back to my little apartment in Chelsea, thinking that I had done such a chic job by painting the walls of Madeleine Castaigne green, and realizing that I lived in the most banal <laughs> world possible. And I wanted that. So I would go out and, and paint stripes on my walls, and I would do things that I thought Joe would have done, because he really did the, this sort of 
strange magazine and strange world and his viewpoint set you free to do things that were not um, probable, you know, <laughs> in the sense of decorating. You know, it made you want to explore a lot more and to really not <clears throat> give a damn about what anybody else thought because it, it was about your hermetic space. It wasn't about trying to look like something mm. your friends lived in or that your neighborhood was a normal look. It was about privacy, but privacy that would then at some point be revealed and exposed um, through words mm -hmm. as well as through images. So it was a lot of, it was a lot of that. I think, I think Lisa's scholarly, much more so than, than I am, and legitimately so, but the idea that, that all these people together, we were given the freedom to explore the greatest obscurity as possible. <laughs> that, that Joe seemed to enjoy that. It was, I know that when we went back and did Derry Moore's photography, went through his archives looking at these articles, and we would, go, or I would, go back and look at the article that had been published at the time. And you instead took the photographs, and ins instead of looking at what, say, um, Architectural Digest had written, I don't remember who wrote it, but who had written about holding the Rothschild's apartment in 1977. You sort of threw that to one side and studied the rooms as if you were a psychologist, <laughs> trying to make sense of why it was and why things were the way they were. And he, he whether he said it or just suggested it or just tapped into all of our own obsessive natures, you, you wanted to study more. You wanted to learn more. You wanted to go and interview the person who had marbleized the baseboards, if they were still alive. You know, whereas, whereas you wouldn't really have that sort of, that's where 2,500 words gets you. So what's the wildest thing you've done in decorating since the days of Nest, for yourself? Uh, <laughs> that, that would not be me. That would be my husband tearing our house apart. OK. <laughs> and coming home and seeing there are columns where there used to be a wall, um, that sort of thing. So I don't imagine that there was ever a help wanted ad in the New York Times for erudite aesthetes to work on an, an, or an extraordinary offbeat publication. So you know, when we were speaking the other morning, which started slow and ended up at a rapid 70 mile an hour pace, but um, uh, you couldn't remember. You couldn't remember how you ended up in this magical world. But, but uh, Lisa, I know that you had a, a, a story uh, about yeah. how you met Joe. Well, I met Joe through my hairdresser, the late Jason Croy, and we shared this hairdresser who was, had a, himself a wonderful interior on, I believe, West 4th Street that Glenn remembers vividly as being painted a sort of, the floor and the walls were painted a sort of periwinkle gray. And, um, you know, it was a charming way to meet somebody who would, influenced my life so greatly. Um, I don't think that Joe ever put out a help wanted ad. Everything was by word of mouth, and I'm sure that he found Mitch via the New York Times. That, that's what comes to mind. Meaning that he had seen something he had he'd written. He'd seen something he'd written, yes. And so, so Jason... I, I, I'm Jason was um, an important sort of... Uh, What's the word I want? Accompaniment to the whole scenario. He would not come there and do our hair, but <laughs> but we would all, you know, go down there to not together necessarily, but we would, you know, get haircuts down there. And also, his his boyfriend, David Brown, was a is a marvelous florist, and so we always had beautiful flowers in the office. So every, I mean, I think the, the detail about the hairdresser and the florist um, just attest to, to Joe's sense of very civilized living and ambiance, as well as actual artifacts. So Nest seemed to turn the, the, the shelter magazine model on its head in many ways. Yes. You know, and, and, and during your talk, I started to, to, to wonder if some of the graphic design uh, influences might have come from downtown punk culture, you know, the sort of collage 
layer and layer, but uh, uh, but but so so. But one of the ways in which it turned its uh, uh, turned the magazine model just uh, generally on its head was as it related to advertising and. Mm. For, for many of us, uh, and maybe some of the uh, editors in this room, <laughs> the advertising is a necessary evil. You know, it's the thing that fills the pages, that gets, allows you to get to the pages that you really want to read, which is the, um, and, and, but with Nest, it seemed like there almost weren't any ads. Well, no, we did have, we had many ads, but the ads were sort of either fashion driven. We did not really have a lot of ads f for textiles and soft furnishings or for furniture. For example, we had, you know, Prada, Dolce and Gabbana, um, but there were peculiar things like when we first started thinking about advertising, which and and Joe wore many hats, and he did hire an advertising manager in the end, but he said, well, I want things like Altoids or Tabasco, you know, he he didn't want home products. He wanted the magazine to have a completely different sort of ethos to it that would re be reflected even in its advertising. Um, so, um, so what was it like working with Joe in the office? I mean, it's, you know, you've got the remote editor here and the remote editor there and the freelance person. That so how did, I mean, how did it come together? Talking, when you were talking about the, you know, the, the years before, really uh, email and everything mm -hmm. that we're also used to now, when you r reminded me that Matthew Stadler was in Portland right. or something, and I remember talking to it. I'd never had that happen before, where you where you went over the edit of a story uh, all the way from Portland. That's where your editor was, or or in London or somewhere and else. And we still used fax machines. I just remember yeah, that. Yeah, right? I remember no, that. We did. I had to buy one. <laughs> for my apartment, I had to buy one. But how, how did, I mean, as it is a, a magazine, it seems like a team sport that occurs in a room with a lot of uh, sc people and, you know, uh, uh, scrappy discussions and arm wrestling. But how does it happen, you know, uh, so remotely and, and come together so exquisitely? I wasn't part of the technical end. Of it. <laughs> well, I, <just> <laughs> I wasn't either, but... I, how things would begin, I think, they would begin in Joe's own mind, which I've described in the talk as a sort of mother load of obsession and memory and interest in things. And we would sit down, he and I, and make a list of perhaps 12 stories that we really passionately wanted to do. And then it was a question of, um, I mean, and Matthew invented many of the stories as well, and Carl Skoggard. Um, but then it was a question of finding really the most unexpected people to realize the story, both in terms of photography, mm -hmm. graphic design, which Joe did, and the writing. And I think Matthew was very important to the magazine because he, you know, he had a bizarre troupe of writers. I mean, they were not decorative arts writers. There were some of us who were steeped in that world. But that's what made the articles, I thought, incredibly interesting, yes. much more so than normal, because, they, because Matthew would, would hire people that were completely, almost at odds with the subject matter. Anti-esthetes, I anti would say. But then, you, but then I, I realized later on that, that you know, the, um, uh, you know, there were poets who used to write articles for House and Garden way back when, who, mm. were, who were big poets. But the idea that you would open it and see these what are they writing about? It was like, like reading a nuclear physicist writing about chintz. It's like, why? Why would this ever happen? <laughs> and, and you, but you read it and you realized it, was a, it showed you a whole different side of something that you weren't familiar with because it wasn't, it wasn't the tropes of talking about furniture. It wasn't matchy-matchy. It was no, really it like um, mis about juxtaposing powerful voices and powerful images. And things you'd never thought, I mean, as people saw on, with, with Lisa's slide program, um, stories that you couldn't imagine appearing in any other magazine on the planet. Um, and that was sort of what made, for me, Nest a really exciting place to work. I remember Joe asking, he was, he's one of a handful of editors I've ever worked for who was really inspiringly permissive. You know, well, what do you want to write about? And then you would say 
what it was, and then it was, when can you get it done? Mm -hmm. And I remember it was the first issue mm -hmm. where, and I don't know how the article even started. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't remember, I remember the conversation. Joe saying, what would you like to write? And I said, the Marquis of Bath has apparently room upon room upon room of pornographic murals at Longbeat. And he said, has it ever been written about? And I said, I don't think so. And he said, well, why don't you find out about it? And like four days later, I was on a plane, flying to London, getting into a, a car, drive, driven to Wiltshire, where I met Lord Bath, who, who Derry Moore did the photography. And I never met Lord Bath, who was sort of this strange combination of hippie meets hobbit. And, <laughs> and he was very in a, man, in a manor house. Yeah, <laughs> a, a nicer person, but also somebody who was colossally like, wounded as a human being. Um, and so you, I, I met him, and I, I, I liked him enormously. And all through Longley, in his private apartment, in every room, there was a, a wood box made by one of the carpenters on the estate. And they held jug, plastic jug wines from France. So there was a like red, rosé, and white, and they were all the same temperature. And they had spigots. And while you were, he handed me a glass, and while I interviewed him, we sort of walked from room to room. And you kept refilling <laughs> your glass all the way through the, up the upper floors, and which was the nursery floor where he'd grown up. And um, I remember seeing these murals, which were astonishingly pornographic. And, and they were made of, of like an encaustic that uh, was painted and was super high relief. And it looked like, and it was textured, it looked like he had taken a spatula and slapped it while it was still wet. So everything was sort of like a, one of those horrible popcorn ceilings. But they were everywhere, every room. And the most couplings you could have, I mean, <laughs> couplings you never even thought of. <laughs> and, and I remember we ended up at one point on the roof of Longleaf. And he's talking about something. And he made an expansive gesture, and all I heard was glass shatter. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and we looked over the edge of the roof. And he had lost his wine glass, and it had hit a chimney, and fell all the way down like four stories, this air shaft. And very quietly, he looked at me and said, I think we should go back inside. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, all right, so we're creeping across the roof to get back through the window, to get back into the house. And all I remember was coming back up in the car to, to, to London, being absolutely tanked. <laughs> and, and sleeping for three hours at the hotel, getting back on the plane, flying back, landing on Monday, and turning in my 2,500 words on Wednesday. Wow. <laughs> and it made it, and what, what I thought, thought was really exciting for, for me as a writer, it made it into the story almost exactly the way I'd written it. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a huge ego boost. Um, there was editing, but it was, it was so colossally light. He wanted you to sound like he wanted to sound. And, and he wanted you to become as obsessed with your subject and with your words explaining the subject. Um, it, it had to be this sort of obsessional package. So what's the, what's the, what's the story that you didn't write that was maybe one of your favorite stories that you remember? I think Lisa showed it, and I, I can't remember who wrote it again, the introduction, the, the women oh, in prison. prison. Yes. That was, A, a story you would never have seen in any magazine. It was shocking. It was shocking. It, you know, it was, it was shocking when you saw it, and it was deeply saddening, and at the same time, it was so buoyant. Because True. True. that spark that human need for ornamentation, that human need for comfort and color to make a statement. You, you could do it under these trying circumstances. There was another article that was so amazing about the, the coffins, the decorated coffins. Yes. I can't remember the exact oh, that makes story about it, but it was genius. We had a section in Nest entitled um, Final Nest. Every month, or rather every quarter, when the magazine would appear. And um, we had a, a variety of funerary stories. And I, actually, I think that was the first thing I was telling Mitch and Glenn the other day. That was the first thing I ever wrote for the magazine. 
um, when they were deciding whether to hire me, they assigned me this story about the Capuchin Cemetery in Rome, which is this endless mosaics of monks' skeletons. And I mean, very beautiful, but arranged into rosettes and you know, almost like stained glass windows, but they're made entirely of bones. And we, we had many a funeral, many a, a, a final nest story. Um, but were they, was it an African conference? I think they were. Yes, that's it, yes. It was painted. Like some place in Africa where they, I think it was West Africa, and they did these elaborate painted coffins, but the people who were eventually going to be interred in them decorated them themselves. So it was just sort of and you done told over and over obsessively they would redecorate them um, until that last moment. Mm -hmm. And I remember I wanted uh, a new English decorator who was doing the same right. thing and I was dying to use a word. Um, dying, <laughs> dying to get into that story because I thought it was so genius. But I, I think that was sort of the wonderful thing is Joe, the magazine taught a lot of us as writers but also readers that Decorating had no boundaries. Decorating has no boundaries. It's not. It, it wasn't about talking about rules, which was so stupid, and it wasn't really talking about you know what works with what. It was just this sort of primal desire to ornament one's space, one's world. Well, I think two things come to mind to come to my mind when you say that. Um, one is a quotation I saw the other day at the Irving Penn exhibition. Um, he said, "A still life is a representation of people." And I think that's so true, and I thought of that in relationship to Nest, how our material traces in the world really represent us and depict us as much as our faces and our bodies. Um, and the other thing I thought of is how art really originated in the dwelling place. It didn't originate with stone tools and arrows and things like that, but with drawings of bulls made in caves. So from 25 million years ago, I think it, is it million or thousand, million I think, um, people had this urge to decorate the place in which they lived and that's really the beginning of art, for what it's worth. So, um, so Lisa, after your 350 square foot, I think you're exaggerating on the size. Yes. I think it was smaller than that. No. <laughs> No, if I remember correctly, with that Your apartment, was than the apartment, I think so. It was. No, but if I remember correctly, you were so devoted to that apartment and every inch of it that you really couldn't bear to have a real bed, because because <laughs> because that would make it too much look like a studio apartment exactly. rather than a salon. So you had a divan, and that well, I had two divans at one time facing each other. They were kind of half of a sort of 1940s, not sectional. That's not the word. I, I, there must be a Christopher, can you think of a tech? Uh, yes, two, two canapes <laughs> that were meant to be side by side, but I have them sort of, there was no room to put them side by side, so I put them facing each other, and I would sleep on a mat in between them. <laughs> that was one scheme, and then <laughs> by the Anything to avoid a bed. Anything <laughs> to avoid a bed. By the time the apartment was photographed for Nest, I had a, a special narrower than twin bed, which a dairy, very dear friend um, created, a Russian friend kept talking to me about something. She said, we picked out a fabric from Rogers and Goffigan actually that was a black uh, velvet. She kept saying, smoking, smoking. I thought she was talking about smoking cigarettes. She was talking about smoking. She wanted to smock <laughs> to the edge of, you know, she created this elaborate, amazing cushion tufted bed cover, which I think with she smoking. actually, with smoking, smoking, <laughs> smoking. <laughs> One thing I wanted to go back is, uh, that, that you said, Glenn, earlier was, um, you know, whether we felt that there were echoes of Nest now. I think when you look back at, at um, I know that so many editors I, I know um, who, who revere Nest from, I mean, my boss, Amy Astley, and when I, when I told her that you had asked me to and participate, she said, oh my God, I have every issue. And it was, wow. you know, and I, and, and, but I think when you look at the layering 
effect that, that Joe did in the art direction. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't open an issue of Cabana without being reminded of, of the, the pattern borders mm -hmm. and the layering of images on top of, of, of motifs, that sort of idea. And then Joe's idea of, of nest as, as or, or, or creation of nest as this sort of art piece four times a year, mm -hmm. it made you think a little bit of floor coals and flare only without the pretension. Mm -hmm. And it was more uh, an, you know, an enthusiasm as opposed to, it wasn't precious in the way that flare was. It, this was, I mean, how, how, I don't even know how to explain that. Well, I think because we had, I don't know how to explain it either, but it was just very, his apartment itself, which I, sh I showed the slides of, is for me really a metaphor of what the magazine was, where there was kind of high and low. And, um, you know, he was, or I think of a, a title comes to mind of a book about Francis Bacon called The Glorious, The, the Glittering and Gutter Life of Francis Bacon. And that's what Nest was, was the glitter and the gutter you know, very glorious things, and then some very dark things, too, that we didn't, ex you know, it, it wasn't all sort of uh, manicured and made up, although it was highly artificial. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes perfect sense. Yes, <laughs> of course. Um, does that apartment still exist? Mine? No. Joe's. His, oh, <laughs> Joe's I'm sorry. Apartment. No, you no, your apartment's mine. in Cologne. Or, yes, yes, something okay. like that. Um, mm. I think that it is inhabited by the ceramic dealer Jason Jacks. Ah, okay. I think so. <coughs> or it, it's probably inhabited by all of them. You know, they probably go back, back and forth between the country house and there, but I know that his gallery has that address. Oh, but I know so. that when, like, you know, Joe's apartment, I'd never, I'd never sit through in an apartment like that, because it really was an embodiment of the magazine and the way, mm. the thought process, and the, 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 like you were saying, the high and low, the, the, the incredible, that incredibly precious burn, which stunned me when I mm. first saw it, and it, you realize there were incredibly important things in this room. I forgot to mention that the urn the urn was next to a Rothko on one side, you know, just Red's number 22. It was, it, I mean, it was, it was like an art history lesson. It was. Uh, but worn so incredibly lightly. And, and Joe was incredibly erudite and very soft-spoken and so full of knowledge. And the apartment that he lived in in the magazine he produced, it, 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 everything, it needed to have footnotes. Everything was a story. You know, you would you would say point out that urn, mm -hmm. and he could talk very casually and fascinatingly about the history of that particular artist and the history of ceramics in France, and, that, and you just felt like it was the education you'd never had, and you realized that one of his great talents was being an autodidact and being a complete sponge mm -hmm. for all sorts of information, and then making these erratic but in the end, very profound connections between the levels, like, like playing three-dimensional chess. Mm -hmm. I, I think a kind of serious point I want to make about all that is that, you know, the idea, you know, you say is there life after nest. Well, there could be, in theory. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that we all had benefited from a kind of education that's faded from the current scene, namely liberal arts education, so that we saw, in other words, we were all born in the 1950s, well you weren't, but um, <clears throat> we benefited from a kind of education that saw the interconnections between things, but saw them in a chronological and historical perspective that as I mean, on the one hand, we have more information available than ever before in a somewhat organized form, but it's all, uh, through the internet, it's all free association rather than um, strict causal historical connection. So we all had, even Joe as an autodidact, as you've called him, um, 
we had a certain type of traditional education that enabled us to put things together mm -hmm. and to see connections in a way that I think would be more difficult to do nowadays for younger people. I mean, they'll put something else together, but it won't be the same. So what do you think, you know, so what, Joe was just sitting around his apartment one day and said, I want to have a magazine. How did he, I mean, you know, given that he was a recluse and really not, or as you described, a sort of reclusive life, that, that what caused him to want to do something, this public, this kind of public outreach? Well, I think he was just an intensely curious person. And that is a trait that combines strangely with being sequestered and private. But, you know, he was in some sense a voyeur, but in a very benign sense, where he wanted to peek into other people's worlds and then kind of give them a budget and creative latitude to do something about those worlds. You know, he, he's, he's a deeply humane person. And do we know what caused the demise? Was it just that the expense was too much at a certain no. point? No. Didn't the article in the New York Times mm -hmm. that it was ending, did, did he not just say something along the lines that he was bored with it now? He's, <laughs> yes, he said that he was beginning to grow bored. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, that he'd sort of taken it as far as he could. And I think that might be. It was a good run, six years. Uh, I think it was enough. So we should go back and you look at the magazines now, as, as I have them all stored away at my house, and you know, going through them for this mm -hmm. presentation. It, it's, it, was, it's, it was the most amazing six years. Right, extremely rich, extremely rich. And just sort of you know, daring in the best Possible way. I mean, it was sort of like that. I mean, as as, as a magazine, in terms of, 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 for me at least, it was like those little string toys you play with cats with. You know, <laughs> you, just, they, you just want to keep going farther and farther. Cat and farther dancer, and I think. And just <laughs> obsessively attached to something, mm -hmm. and and read about it and learn about it, and and there's something to be said what you said earlier about you know a, a, a liberal arts education and trying to make those connections between things and realizing how Joe was very Catholic in, in his appreciation of everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was what I found really freeing about the magazine. The only thing that was sneered at was, was, were things that were boring and, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, traditional or common. You know, that was, that was really the only thing he And didn't even see those people about. he gave kind of a lot of latitude to. Right. You know, he, when you, what you said about his apartment being a sort of, um, you know, an encyclo, I, I don't remember what word he used, but I mean, it was encyclopedic in its depth of decoration. But <clears throat> he had me write captions for the story about the apartment, which had been titled, was written by Carl, his partner, and it was called, I Too Married a Decorator. <laughs> and I was supposed to impersonate somebody called Mother Swatch who was like Sister Parrish, who would write very decoratory kind of <laughs> comments about, oh, this cheerful red painting, you know, the Rothko. <laughs> <laughs> Matches beautifully, but, you know, whatever. I mean, it was, so he had a great deal of levity and humor about um, the very serious objects that he so, owned. So you had a nom de plume as well. Mother Swatch. Yes, yes. okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, who was impersonated in turn physically by his neighbor, Micheline. Oh, <laughs> see that, I guess I was confused. I, was that, she was photographed in the magazine. Yes, wasn't yes. Right? And yes. It, it was, a, it was a, 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 a subscription ad or something like that with a cute boy. Yes. Yeah, okay. I do remember that. So um, is there any, uh, I'm just wondering if there's any, any questions that have popped up uh, from anybody in the, uh, in the outside world? <laughs> 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 We're in our little inside world here, but is there any questions? I'm yes. I'm curious, what did uh, Joe and the others do after the magazine was sold? Well, as far as I know, Joe retired to upstate New York with Carl 
and has become a very serious painter. And he had an exhibition, I think you, yes, Mitch, has seen. It was, it was quite good. At the University Art Museum or at the Hammer? Hammer. Oh, Hammer. The Hammer, really? Yes, so he's now yes, he's good. an abstract good. painter. And I sort of do remember that transition talking to him after the magazine closed and he said, well, I've been going to the Met a lot and looking at the paintings. And I believe that, you know, I think that, that he looked at things very intensely. Okay, anything else? All right, so then, then uh, uh, I do have a few more things that I want to say. I, wa I do want to uh, go back to my start of the evening, which is <laughs> reading my closing notes which is uh, thanking David Sproul's and the staff here at the New York School of Interior Design. Um, I also want to thank Lisa for her remarkable presentation and thank Lisa and Mitch for their insights and antidotes on this wild ride at NEST. And, uh, and I hope that the talk's been interesting, enlightening, uh, uh, and that even whet your appetite to learn and experience more. And some of you may already know this, but our distinguished panelist, uh, Mitch Owens, will be giving the NYSED commencement lecture uh, and receiving an honorary doctor from the school. And so I'm also at this moment thrilled to let you know that the School of Interior De of New York School of Interior Design will be presenting a comprehensive, and I can only imagine, full-blown, out-of-control Nest exhibition, spring 2018 in the NYSED galleries with Dr. Mitchell Owens serving as curator. <laughs> and so the wild... Uh, the, so the wild ride continues uh, in 2018. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you.